Now, what you just saw, if a little dramatic, was the cyclotron facility in Sydney run by Australia's Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation, or ANSTO for short. Now, this video will be one of two videos that I'm going to pre-produce, and in an up-and-coming video, I'm going to take you through the workings of this ANSTO facility and how this cyclotron is being used in research and the productions of radiopharmaceuticals, such as FDG, which is used in PET scans. But before we do that, we need to know what a cyclotron is and how it works. In this video, I'm going to introduce the cyclotron and discuss the principles of how it works. So stay tuned. So a cyclotron, in essence, is what we can call a particle accelerator. And we are dealing here with the very, very small. In essence, subatomic particles, such as protons and electrons, but we can get a little bit more massive, such as ions. And particle accelerators use the principle that if a particle is electrically charged, then we can manipulate it with electric and magnetic fields. Now, one could argue that cathode ray tubes are also particle accelerators. They speed up electrons, but they're really not particularly fast. In the early part of the 20th century, scientists realized that you could probe the structure of matter by firing particles at it. And they came to realize that the faster the particles, the more energy, and therefore the more you can learn about the nature of matter. So the challenge was on to build devices that allowed you to get ever increasing speeds of subatomic particles. Now this led to the development of the first working cyclotron by Ernest Lawrence in 1931. Now this device was able to get protons to 80 kilo electron volts. Now that's a speed of 3,900 kilometers per second. In subsequent years, bigger cyclotrons were built with ever-increasing energies. But how do they actually work? Now, the cyclotron basically needs two components. The first component involves this hollow disk, which is separated out, and these two components are often referred to as the Ds. And we have this gap in between them. What we can do is apply a voltage across them. So in other words, we can have, let's say, one side being positively charged, the other one side being negatively charged, or we could reverse that like so. Now, what does that do? Well, that sets up an electric field between these two Ds. And if I place a charge in between those two Ds, that charge is gonna experience a force, it's gonna accelerate, it's gonna gain in energy, particularly because it's gaining in velocity. And that's the key that we wanna talk about. The second component is the application of a magnetic field. In this case, the magnetic field is going up the page. And so when we have a charge that is moving within this sphere, it now experiences a force due to the magnetic field, but in this case, it experiences a centripetal force. Now to explore that more closely, let's have a look at it from a two-dimensional perspective. So here I have my two Ds, and you can see I have a negative side on the left and the positive on the other side, and I'm going to inject a proton into the center. Now what's gonna happen here is this proton is going to accelerate towards the negative plate in the direction of the electric field. Now what does that mean mathematically? We have work done on our charge, and that means a gain in kinetic energy and that is equal to the charge multiplied by the voltage. So the voltage difference between these two plates will cause it to accelerate and therefore gain in velocity. What happens when it now is within this cavity here? It's now no longer in between two differences of potential. And so in this case, the force that it experiences is due to the magnetic field, but this applies a centripetal force. We know that the Lorentz force is QVB, but this results in a centripetal force, which is MV squared over R. Now, if I rearrange this, I'm going to get V over R is equal to charge multiplied by B divided by the mass. In a moment, I'm gonna explain why I put it in this particular form. Now what's gonna happen is my charge is going to now go a circular path with a particular velocity. But then when it gets to this position here, the polarity changes. And so as a result, it now is attracted towards the negative plate and it speeds up. But now it has an increased velocity. So now it's going to start turn in a larger arc because it's now moving faster. When it gets to this point over here, the polarity changes. But remember, it's going faster and faster. And so as a result, the radius of turn increases, gets to here, 
the polarity changes and the process continues. It goes around and around and continue to go larger and larger and larger every single time until such time we get to the edge and we may allow the proton to escape, which it means this case, it will have a really high velocity. So this is what it looks like. So in essence, the charged particle spirals out of the cyclotron as it continues to go faster and faster and faster at a greater and greater radius every single time it passes through the D because of the change in polarity, it continues to increase in velocity. So now we come to the point as to how often does this polarity have to change? What's the rate of change of that polarity? That is related to the velocity of our proton. In this case, our angular velocity. Let me explain. We have our formula, which was V over R is equal to QB over M. But if you know your angular velocity formula, which says that the velocity is equal to R times omega, omega being the angular velocity, then V over R equals the angular velocity. So angular velocity is QB over M. Now this is rotating faster and faster and faster in a linear sense, but the angular velocity actually doesn't change. Why? Because the charge doesn't change, the magnetic field doesn't change, and the mass doesn't change. So the angular velocity of our proton remains constant. The angular velocity is equal to 2 pi f, which is the frequency of the rotation. So now we get this formula, and then we get the frequency is equal to qb over 2 pi multiplied by our mass. That means the frequency of this changing of the voltage has to be the frequency of the charge going across here. And so that's in essence what happens. The voltage changes every half of the period as it goes along. So the frequency of the potential change is equal to the frequency of our charge particle. And in essence, the voltage is a step function. So in other words, the voltage will look something like this. A positive and then negative voltage and so forth. And this here is our one period. And of course, one over that period will give us the frequency of the voltage and that will cause the charge to turn around. So let's apply that to Ensto's cyclotron in Sydney. Ansto's rated uh, energy is 18 mega electron volts. Now 18 mega electron volts is the energy of our particle. This is the energy of our proton. If we wanted to work out what the velocity is, it's simply a very simple formula. And that is E is equal to a half mv squared. Now our energy is 18 by 10 to the power of six electron volts. In order to convert that to joules, we multiply it by 1.6 by 10 to the negative 19. That is equal to a half multiplied by my mass of my proton, which is 1.67 by 10 to the power of negative 27, multiplied by V squared. The velocity ends up being 5.87 by 10 to the power of seven meters per second. That is approximately 0.196 multiplied by the speed of light. Now that velocity is reasonably slow so that any relativistic momentum increases aren't playing a significant part in the energy of our protons as they leave. But what if you start to get speeds where relativistic momentum is a factor? In essence, the frequency of the voltage has to increase as the momentum increases due to this relativistic nature. And the voltage frequency has to be in sync with the rotational velocity. Now that's a much greater engineering challenge, but it led to the development of what is called the synchrocyclotron, which includes the one that was built at CERN in the early 50s, that was CERN's first particle accelerator. And we are here at the first particle accelerator at CERN, the synchrocyclotron. Pretty exciting. So now let's get into the application of our cyclotron. And in the case of ANSO cyclotron, it produces a chemical called FDG. Now FDG is a form of a radioactive glucose that releases positrons. And those positrons annihilate with electrons to produce gamma radiation. And wherever glucose is metabolized, this metabolizes. And so you can determine where there is more glucose metabolism occurring by this 
emission of positrons and the gamma radiation. Now, I discussed that further in my videos on PET scans, so check that out if you want more detail. Now, in essence, what happens is, is that the cyclotron accelerates hydride ions. Now, what are hydride ions? Hydride ions are basically hydrogen atoms with an extra electron. This is what is accelerated in our cyclotron. Then as they leave the cyclotron, they are passed through as what is known as an electron stripper. Basically, strips the electrons off it. And so what you end up getting is a stream of protons. Because basically hydrogen is simply a proton in terms of its nucleus. Now this proton is fired into water, which is enriched with oxygen 18. So we have oxygen 18. It encounters our protons, which are now at the right velocity to join with the oxygen atoms to produce fluorine 18. You can see the numbers don't quite add up just yet. So what is also produced is a neutron and some gamma radiation. This is the product we're interested in, the fluorine. Now it's this fluorine that is then attached to a form of glucose called 2-deoxyglucose. Now I'm not going to go through the process of how they do that, but the end product is the substance we're after. In this case, it's called fluorodeoxyglucose, FDG. It looks like a glucose molecule, except where there's an oxygen, we have a fluorine. And as I mentioned to you before, it's that fluorine that decays into oxygen with the release of a positron, which then annihilates with a local electron to produce a gamma radiation burst, which is then picked up by the gamma camera. So that's how FDG is produced. Now, today, cyclotrons have been superseded by synchrotrons, at least in terms of investigating matter. Do check out my video on how a synchrotron works, where I use the Large Hadron Collider at CERN as an example. But cyclotrons are still being used in research, and as mentioned, in the production of radio pharmaceuticals. In an up-and-coming video, I'm going to take you through the tour of Anstos Research Cyclotron, based in Sydney, and how it's being used. So keep an eye out for that. So I hope that has been helpful for you to understand how a cyclotron works. Please like, share and subscribe, hit the bell so that you get my latest updates. Drop a comment down below if this has been particularly useful to you. And please consider supporting me, whether regularly via Patreon or a one-off payment via PayPal. The details are in the description below. My name is Paul from Physics High. Take care. Bye for now.